I'm Michael Conrad. You find me on page five of this brochure. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you tonight. I mean, this is wonderful to have you here. Uh, this is a beautiful summer night still out there uh, that you come into the Berlin School. <laughs> to be with us for President's Lecture is quite an honor. Um, this is the 11th President's Lecture. And uh, today we have a very special guest, a friend, uh, but also a man who was very much at the beginning of the digital H, and I call him a new romantic of the digital age, a poet in digital communication, and a pioneer of uh, uh, this um, uh, sort of field of communication. For his work, he has received, I mean, numerous prestigious awards, amongst them some lions, golden lions in Cannes, even uh, the most prestigious award in the world, maybe a black pencil uh, from Dean A.D. Um, I'm saying poet because what he's doing, he is bringing the digital age back to the normal, modest, daily things we like so much, like having a conversation on the table. So how to do that with a digital spin? Or looking at the mobile from Calder, how to do that with a digital spin today? So, I mean, to me, it's goosebumps. People have enjoyed it in the Centre Pompidou, in the Städtische Museum in Amsterdam, uh, at the Venice Biennale, and obviously at the BMW Museum. The first time I ran into uh, uh, the work of uh, uh, Art and Kamm and, and, and Joachim Sauter was at the Jewish Museum here. And that comes back to the table I was talking about. And I hope that is part of your presentation. So enjoy the digital poet that we have here from Berlin, Joachim Sauter. So thank you, Michael. I say Michael, not Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, yes, this was an enormous introduction, and I hope I can uh, really uh, uh, be as precise as you pre uh, predicted my presentation. Um, I had the honor to follow the development of your school from the very beginning. Uh, I didn't do too much for it. I, I really. I'm very sorry about that. We had a first meeting, I think, uh, about the school in your wonderful garden in, in Zurich. And uh, what's now the outcome is totally astonishing. So I, I, th I know uh, nearly every uh, of the courses now, and I met people and I discussed uh, with them. And I think what you uh, achieved in the last few years is really, really uh, very good. OK, now uh, to what I want to talk about. Uh, first, I want to thank you to have the uh, possibility, ability to talk about my work here because uh, the work of art comes, so I'm not alone. I'm uh, in a group with other ones together. Uh, and uh, there's very often the problem to identify us. If I as, uh, ask people, please describe what we are doing, they say, okay, you're, you're making interesting project, cool stuff, but uh, it's very difficult to sort you in one of the traditional disciplines. Uh, to make it very short, uh, I don't want to claim the, the, the title poet, but what we are doing, I make it in a very dry, dry way. Uh, we are an interdisciplinary group here located in Berlin, composed out of designers, artists, scientists, and technologists, and we are doing new media installation and, and new media spaces. So that's in a very short uh, phrase at the beginning. And being uh, interdisciplinary is a uh, very often a big advantage. Uh, I think that's a no-brainer because you can solve problems from a very unusual standpoint. Uh, but on the other hand, as mentioned before, it 
also makes problems because, for instance, the advertisement world, they don't accept us because we are too arty. The art world don't accept us because we are too techy. The tech world uh, doesn't accept us because we are too designy, but everyone loves what we are doing. So uh, I hope I can uh, use the next hour to show that behind this unclearness uh, that there is a, a clear attitude. And uh, I want to start a little bit uh, in the very early uh, times of Artcom. Um, why do we exist? For this I have to go back into the early 80s. There we had the widespread of the personal computers. This was the starting point for us uh, of the digital age. And actually I had been lucky because this was my very first one, the first <laughs> Apple Macintosh <laughs> cube. And as an educated designer and filmmaker, I use it heavily as a tool, as all my colleagues use it as a tool. So it was understood as a tool to write, to animate, to model, to make uh, imaging and whatever. And then, let's say in the mid of the 80s, slowly, uh, there was a group in the University of the Arts who starts to understand that it's not only a tool but a medium with which you can communicate information. And this transformation from tool to medium, in the meantime it's a mass medium as we all know, was the reason to found Artcom. And the other reason was that the University of the Arts, who is, had been a very traditional university, didn't accept technology in their house. So we went out, uh, we had been, as mentioned, we had been designers, artists and uh, a group of the Chaos Computer Club, which is a hacker group here in Berlin. So we uh, teamed together and uh, we founded Artcom. And in the meantime, uh, we started with 12 people. In the meantime, we are around 50 people. Um, as in real life, uh, also a company has these phases of seven years. I don't know if it's in your companies, it's the same, but in my life and in Artcom's life, we have these seven year spans. Uh, the very first one, uh, in, if you are in uh, innovative new technology, it's the prediction time. So in, in our case, it was understanding technology, first seven years. The second seven years, and I don't know if you can transfer it to other companies, but in our case, it was proof. So we prove technology, we show technology, and the third seven years, which we just at the end, is the present phase where we hide technology. So the medium, or in that case the technology, is matured and you can really seriously communicate with it. Um, I only want to go very quickly to the, uh, over the first seven years, skip the second seven years and come to the last seven years. And I have to apologize because I go now very, very quickly to the first seven years. Um, we had been very lucky that we had access to uh, very exceptional technology at that time. Uh, everyone knows that it was, uh, it was the big virtual reality hype time and we had, we had been lucky getting the very first iPhone data glove which was uh, available from our friends from the west coast and we started to make research onto that. But let's say after two, three months it was totally clear that this is not actually in any way meaningful. So people were uh, uh, immersed in something, they were in a single situation, they didn't have any relation to the outside world. So we made these things with uh, city planning in Berlin, it was meaningless. So uh, what we did, uh, we misused technology. This is something which is always uh, quite fruitful. So on all these very expensive iPhones, there was this little sensor measuring your orientation and your position in space and we used it and uh, and uh, used the aerial shot of Berlin and you were able to navigate with this little thing over the map it was like a table coming to the table it's like going with a finger over map and people were immediately uh, using it so we discussed the city planning of Berlin in, with this very root uh, polygon worlds uh, against 18 years ago and so we were, you were able to navigate through it in, and, and talk to people and ha you had a relationship to what you are looking at. Uh, same year uh, 
Daimler-Benz commissioned us uh, <laughs> uh, commissioned us to make uh, a prediction of the future of how you sell cars, or how you configure cars. And they were so keen on having this iPhone used that we okay, we do it for you, but you will see it's, it's not really meaningful. And uh, so we built this uh, model where you can sit in, scale one to one, put different kind of cars under your uh, under the helmet, and you were able to uh, navigate through it. But as you see, <laughs> not really meaningful. So we proposed uh, a totally different uh, uh, approach and said, okay, we are using a window into the virtual world. In the meantime, it's, it's a known technology. So we substitute a, a real car in scale one to one with a virtual one, and you have this monitor. So this was 95 or something. Uh, and you were able to navigate around, and because you have an absolute navigation, you're walking two meters in real space, you also walk two meters in virtual space, you know how our car is uh, 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 oriented, so you know where to find the steering wheels. So you were able to navigate through it and uh, experience it, and for sure, because uh, we used the touch screen, you were also able to configure the car. So for instance, here the hubcaps, you were able to touch it. So it's always the relation to the real world which we try to achieve with that. So uh, the most important development, design or invention uh, was uh, in 94, 95, a project for us was TerraVision. Again, it was about the prediction of the future. So fortunately, we had very strong machines, computers. This is how I looked like 15 years ago. <laughs> Long hairs. Uh, I skipped that. Um, and we made this project where you were able to navigate around the world to find everything. You were able to navigate from outside down to uh, every place on the earth. Uh, you know that in the meantime. Um, <laughs> and to superimpose information, I go quickly through it. So this was 94 in, in Kyoto at the ICU conference where we showed it the first time. So even, yeah, billboards where, where, you, where we'd shown uh, uh, temperature. Here, this is Berlin with our offices at that time. So we were able to navigate down there and also add architectural information. So that is our office. Nick, probably you know it, you remember it. Uh, and for sure, I know this is something which Google Earth actually started to do. We also uh, made research about historical aerial shots. So we had uh, aerial shots from uh, 92 at that time to 28. So we were not only able to navigate through space, but also through time. And I think they are starting now to implement that too. Uh, and webcams for sure. So uh, 94. Uh, and this is probably our most important documented outcome, that's the patent on Google Earth. Unfortunately, we are not able up to now to get the money from them. They are a little bit too strong, but we are, <coughs> we are trying hard. Um, and then all the problems will be sol solved, economic problems will be solved. Uh, probably out of curiosity, one other thing, uh, no, that's the wrong one. <coughs> Uh, having all these good connections to the tech scene worldwide, we also were able to get the very first pre-release of the very first uh, uh, browser, Mosaic browser from CERN, from Tim Berners-Lee, which we knew, and made probably, it's the first website in Germany. So, And, and, and you see the illustration I used at that time, how difficult it was to, to, to realize that. Okay. This had been the first uh, seven years. It was about prediction. It was about research. Um, it was about having huge machines, spending a lot of money, which we got from Daimler-Benz, from Deutsche Telekom, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the second uh, phase, as, as mentioned before, we proved it. We made a lot of applications. Uh, which had been then shown in the real world uh, for short times. And now, in the last seven years, we are really doing communication with this new medium. Um, this is 
to explain a little bit for our clients what we are doing. So this is not scientifically correct, but we have four formats in which we are working in. One is a screen-based application. This is every application you see on a, uh, you can run on an off-the-shelf computer, like websites, DVDs, whatever. We don't do it uh, very often now. The second one are interactive installations. That's the main focus. And what we are doing, these are purpose-made objects in space uh, with which we communicate information, narration, poetry, whatever. Then we are designing interactive environments. These are spaces defined through medium. So you are, you are not in front of a medium, but you are inside a medium, you are immersed. And last one, they are interactive architecture. So mainly at the moment, they are media facades. It's reduced onto media facades, although we are doing a lot of uh, experiments in, in, in uh, reactive volumes, but up to now it's mainly, uh, yeah, out of economic <laughs> reasons, uh, mainly facades. So I go through some of the project. I take my time now and uh, start with a project uh, Michael uh, mentioned before. Uh, one of the very early multi-touch tables, 2003-2004, uh, it was uh, commissioned by the Jewish Museum. They had a very nice exhibition about numbers, the meaning of numbers, and they commissioned us with an installation where they asked us to make something because it's very, there are very few artifacts or objects which can be exhibited in, in the field of numbers. So they asked us to do something uh, which allows people to interact with uh, the meaning of numbers. Um, we designed a 9 by 2 meter table, and as mentioned before, uh, we, used it uh, we used the table purposely as a metaphor because it's connotated with the idea of communication. We are all sitting around uh, tables and we are communicating with them. And uh, so we also, we try to, it's a little bit dark, but I think you can imagine how it works. In the meantime, I think it's also the multi-touch technology is known. Um, but we had this constant stream of numbers floating over the table. And from time to time, numbers are coming up to the surface. And then they were able to be touched. And then they revealed their meaning. So uh, there was uh, cultural, any kind of cultural meaning, religious meaning, scientific meanings, uh, explored by typography, by little films, but also by some interactive uh, games or applications. So I think it's only a number which is relevant in the German-speaking countries. For everyone who don't know, it's an old machine gun. There is where the term 0815 derived from. So uh, it is, it's a very easy and simple interaction principle. You only have to touch something, nothing else. And especially if you are in public space or semi-public spaces like museums, you only have 20, maximum 30 seconds to give the first success to the, uh, to the people. So afterwards you can make things more complicated, but at the very beginning you have to be very direct. So this is what we learned. So. Um, also very important for us is that we are programming our stuff by, our, by ourselves. So the, 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 the discipline of computational design is now, let's say, 10 years old. What means that you as a designer are capable to design things and design things out of the knowledge of code. And this helps us very much to uh, bring people into projects like this one. So um, what we did, here was that we went out made make research about behavior. So we went into, into, the, uh, into the aquarium, looked how fishes were swimming, and uh, tried to implement it into this application. So this is the table and all the numbers, we threw them in, and they are so-called typobots. So they have a behavior. And this behavior can be understood by the visitors. So for instance, here we have a flow path and I can then throw in all the numbers and they are floating according to a certain kind of behavior around this flow path. Uh, or for instance, the typography. 
Uh, so they have a kind of behavior. They are hungry. They're going after my uh, cursor. And if I activate them, they're reorganizing them to a meaningful sentence. So if people see behavior in an application, they are much more open to interact with it. Instead of only going in this kind of tree structure down an application. And this is what we are doing up to now, adding a behavior into a system which at least pretends to be autonomous. So a little bit about the technology. Uh, it's very simple. It's a wooden table. Uh, it's very robust. And under the table, we have a sensor, which we, a sen a sensor system which we developed in-house and uh, which allows us to make really robust objects in, in, a, in a public space. So we are working and we're doing a lot of this, uh, a lot of these tables up now today, or not only tables, but sensitive surfaces. We call them sensitive surfaces. That's for the O2 store, for instance. So it's for industry and for uh, the cultural area. That's for the Documenta, that's for uh, Intel. That's for the Science Museum in London. And uh, as mentioned before, people are really uh, deeply involved into the interaction because they are interacting with the content and they have people juxtaposed to each other and they're talking about what they found. So, sorry, this is Mrs. Merkel, it's nice to do with you. Um, I talked about hiding technology. So you really are not, you're not dealing with technology. You're dealing with everyday objects. And uh, another example for this is uh, the design of the Natural History Museum here in Berlin. Uh, we had been lucky to get the uh, commission to redesign the museum. And if you see this space, this beautiful uh, space, and the beautiful objects in there, you don't want to put any kind of monitor into that or any kind of media. But the visitors, they are asking for this. Because you, nowadays, if people are going into a museum, they want to interact. They want to come from uh, the knowledge they, or interaction principles they know from the computer. They want to see it in, in physical space. And we achieved to integrate a lot of this uh, medium into the uh, museum. Every red dot is a M. M but you don't see them. Because, again, uh, we put them into everyday objects. In this case, uh, we see these telescopes. So there are telescopes which allows you to point onto the dinosaurs. Now I need sound again. And then you can pan around. And if you have a dinosaur in the center of your field of view, it starts to become live. So you have a real di direct correlation between the physical ob object in space and the dinosaur. And then we made 25 second animations, always a, a communication between the dinosaur and you. That was always the starting point. And then the explanation why they are looking as they're looking, in this case, because they're eating from trees. And then we had to find a way, bring them back in the <coughs> original position because then there was a dissolve into the real space again. So we did it for all the dinosaurs, and they have one raptor into it. And then there we decided to make it a little bit harder. And uh, we also had uh, this, this kind of shaking loudspeakers in the, in, the, uh, in the installation. So you're standing onto it. And you really hear the, the guy because he's jealous, he thinks. So again, a little bit of involvement. Okay, back into the museum. Um, it really works quite well uh, in all ages. Um, so the, she just saw the raptor. <laughs> but this is more the usual uh, expression you get if you're in the museum. 
So probably you have time to go over the next few days as long as you're in Berlin. But as you see, you don't see any medium. And that, that's, that's the, that had been the goal at that time. Having respect towards the building, having respect towards the objects uh, exhibited in there. Um, a last exhibition project, uh, we had been invited to uh, participate at an exhibition to the 50th anniversary of the signature of the Treaty of Independence of Austria. Uh, and usually we're working very closely together with uh, exhibition designers. So for instance, with Nick, we did some projects together. So it was because we are not scenographers, we are media designers. And uh, the best thing is if you really do it in a very integrative way. But for this project, we decided to separate everything. Um, so we separated the whole project into a scenographer, into an art curator, and into us. So the outer wall was given to a um, scenographer, and he exhibited all these uh, historical objects on the wall, all the papers, all the objects, documents, etc., etc. So every space was a decade. And the inner walls went to an art curator, and we got the space in between, metaphorically and physically. And we said, OK, we want to have a 260 meter long Austrian flag waving through the whole museum and telling the history of Austria. So the flag was full of interactive and digital and non-digital uh, communication parts. So for instance, the first space was uh, the first decade, the pre-First World War decade, there you were able to listen into the flag. So literally, you could, you could, you could hear the old emperor, for instance. So the flag of the country is the narrator of the history of the country. So First World War, very brutal pictures. Uh, we, wo we had woven uh, slides into the, uh, into the flag and people were able to look in a very intimate way with mag magnifying glasses into that. Or here the uh, transition between the pre-Second World War and the uh, time when Germany occupied Austria. So you had to go over marching as our soldiers into that next space over the flag so there was no possibility to go around that and we had loudspeakers uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the doorways and it's a really intense situation. Then the, the post-war time, the occupation, then the first time you were allowed to touch the flag was an interactive surface. Then again, audio uh, uh, communication. In this case, we brought the sound so low that people had to go very closely and then they bowed in front of the flag. So this was something which you always can do. You can dramatize the visitors. So here was the original uh, Treaty of Independency. I go quickly through it. Uh, this is something in very interesting in Austria, the cliches. There are a lot of cliches in Austria, so we decided to make a, a bowl of soup out of the Austrian flag, and you can steer in it and find cliches. Sorry, sorry. Okay, and then uh, the Jimmy Hendrix version. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went over the flag, went over to the next page. This was about uh, uh, economy. So we made a very obvious object here about the brutto sozialprodukt. What is this in English? The GDP of, of Austria compared to the Europeans. Then the space about social history, there we uh, used again a, a well-known interface, a, a Super 8 camera, 
and uh, you were able to find historical films, private movies in that. So you only took the camera and then the x-axis was topics like birthday, like traveling, first holidays and the y-axis had been time. So again, using an everyday interface. Everyone knows how to use it. The last space was about Europe and Austria, a very difficult topic, how can you communicate that? So we made a table in the shape of Austria and used again an everyday object, a microscope. And on this microscope you have this turning wheel which allows you to make the things sharp. But this allows you, allowed you to fly from outside Europe uh, by turning the wheel. We also uh, mirrored it on, on, on a huge projection that the other ones can also see it uh, flying from outer space. You saw Europe down to Austria, into Vienna, uh, into the Belvedere, and we put a, a, a zoom camera on the ceiling so you could see yourself and zoom onto your bold hair or whatever. So, uh, but the idea behind it, I don't, I don't know if, if people got it, but the idea was to see yourself in the context of Europe. So. Um, some, what, what's very important for us at the moment, and we talked about this before, was going from the semi-public space into the public space. In the semi-public space, people more or less know what they will expect. They expect the topic to be discussed in space. And, but in public space, it's, the, uh, it's something totally different because people don't expect some media in public space. Um, and that's one example of our work in public space. The commission uh, from Tokyo, there was a new development area and uh, we could choose a place to make something which is usually called public art. We say it's an attempt to make something which gives identity to the space. So it's not this kind of fountain thrown into a, or a, a sculpture but something which really adds uh, uh, identity to a space. So we decided for this public uh, sidewalk, which was adjacent to an artificial pond. So people are coming from the subway and then they are going into uh, their office buildings. And we try to give them a moment of poetry or reflect, uh, re reflection or whatever. So uh, we made an installation dealing with light waves and water waves, with solid and li liquid, with immateriality and materiality. Uh, we uh, designed a six by six meter LED floor. People were able to walk over it, create virtual waves, which then became real waves when they hit the water. So um, this was the concept, and then we had to realize it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think that's something which is very important. You have you have to take risks. If not, you don't move yourself. So, uh, but we achieved it. Uh, uh, so we uh, used the LED matrix. Then we had opaque glass onto it with weight cells. So we could measure exactly where people are walking and how heavy they are. Uh, with this, we then uh, produced virtual waves, which then were, uh, uh, were then made into the real water with actuators. So, Again, uh, an attitude which is very important for us is, as mentioned before, to high technology. In this case, we said, okay, we do it monochrome, so that it has no association or connotation with video or any monitor. We uh, put opaque glass over it, so it's more a kind of ephemeric light which is coming out. So it's not, you don't feel as if it's a monitor, or if it's a LED wall or a billboard or something. So we are very good in doing virtual water because this is an installation we did for a whiskey brewery some years ago. Uh, but the difficult thing is to make precise real waves. And uh, so I went to my colleagues in the Technical University and said, oh, pff, no way. Either you can make uh, waves with an actuator in one size or in one speed, but not different sizes in different speeds. So we were working with this kind of solenoid actuators, so you see 
different, we can make different speed, but it's always the same size of waves. But then one of the designers uh, came onto the idea to say there's a very old principle from the 16th, 17th century, 16th century, from Huygens, who said if you are adding different small waves in a precise way, you then get a large wavefront. And with this, you can then compose different sizes of waves. So this is what we then did. Here you see the, yeah, you can see it a little bit. This is the virtual wave, and these are the actuators, which are then firing in different uh, rhythms and created then different kind of uh, different waves here. It's a little bit dark, sorry for that. But you see these are different waves. Every color is another wave. Yes, and this is how it looks uh, nowadays. So uh, we made a lot of observation how people uh, accept it. So 90% don't even recognize it, but 10% are very happy with that and uh, then start to interact with it. And I don't know if the others don't, because in Japan it's not really common to show you up in, in public space. Um, but then, and this is a, a thing which is very important for us. This is a reactive installation, not an interactive installation. So it's not made by purpose, it's by accident. But it's very often a door opener to interact. So people then start to interact and, and walk around and, and play with it. So now I go to the next format, which is interactive environments. As mentioned before, uh, interactive environments are spaces defined through media. So you are inside the medium and not in front of the medium. Uh, let's see, I show, I show you a, a very typical, but probably too obvious, it's, it's, uh, it's a stage. It's a stage for an opera. There are also other interactive spaces, but this is uh, probably one which explains it quite well. I was called by a friend who is a composer. He was commissioned with an opera what I, in 1999 was. That, what I found really interesting that nowadays operas are commissioned in Germany, but it is. And he asked me if we were interested in to design a stage, a virtual stage together with him in the process of the composition. And <clears throat> we started with him. Very interesting. At the very beginning, we were discussing about uh, what might be the right metaphor for this play. In this case, it's the Jew of Malta, which takes place in a monastery. And so we said, okay, the appropriate metaphor nowadays would be a, a bunker, because a bunker is prison and shelter at the same time. And a monastery is also prison and shelter at the same time. So, I probably can switch off this light. Uh, or, or bring it down. Um, so we model the bunker in a virtual way, very simple, it's very easy to do that, but it's very difficult to bring this virtual object onto stage. You can switch it on afterwards, so. <laughs> but they are so, so dark, these pictures. So the idea was now to bring it into stage by using huge uh, rear projection screens and only projection, projecting the intersection through this bunker uh, according to their uh, intersection to the bunker. So it's like slicing sausages. You get this? Okay. So it's a virtual bunker standing on the stage, but you don't see it. You only see the slice, which is defined through the rear projection screens. So quite interesting architecture, which is coming out because it's a sliced bunker. So we did the first tests by using three rear projection screens, uh, three projectors, uh, three computers, every computer was uh, computing the intersection through a bunker which was standing on the table. I hope that it's cool. so this is how it looks like. And we got the very first uh, music from the composer and we really saw that things are going together. So in, we saw that through the movement of these intersections, we could produce a real three-dimensional situation. So, why did we do it? 
it was for sure not to show technology. So in this case, we only used, and you will see it afterwards, only to dramatize and support the storyline. Um, in this story, we have Machiavelli, which is the main figure in this, uh, in this play. He has power over the stage, over all the other actors. And we decided to glue the center of gravity of the bunker onto the position of Machiavelli. So if Machiavelli was turning around, the whole bunker turned around. Or if he was walking in front of the stage, the bunker was following. Uh, so interactivity was used to show his power because he was the only one who could, uh, uh, who could interact with the stage. So we developed a kind of very precise tracking system so we knew where Machiavelli was on stage. And then he was able, for instance, at the very beginning to open up the stage only with his arms. And every time the stage was redesigned, recomputed, and he then could decide to start the play. So it was really to show his power over the story. Here's the tracking system. So we used gestures, we used movements. And here's a sequence which shows you uh, how three-dimensional we could get with these intersections through this virtual bunker. So different interaction principle, for instance, if it was moving quite quickly, it could accelerate the whole bunker. So there was a second uh, thing we developed for it. There was a huge problem because the composer decided to defragment the libretto in a way that no one could follow anymore. So he used an algorithm erasing all prime number letters. So it was difficult. So we decided to design a costume design, a virtual costume design, which shows the inner conditions of the actors. So with this we developed a system allowing us to project totally precise onto the actors. So we detected the outline, created masks, so they could move around as they want. It was a real-time computing of masks, and we were then able to project onto them. So this was in the uh, rehearsals. You see a little bit of projection artifacts here. But then, uh, in the premiere, it was really very precise. So we used the infrared camera, took real-time 25 second, uh, shots per second, computed a mask out of it, added the texture to it, and projected it from the position of the camera onto the actors. So from two sides. So it was really like if they were wrapped around the virtual costume. And this we used then to dramatize the story in a very simple way. A very, very simple way. So for instance, they had a fight, and as soon as they agreed, they get the same texture. So uh, in a very basic way, we try to support the storyline with that. OK, there was, it's much more complicated, because you actually you can't, one camera can't detect if people are, if uh, uh, actors are overlapping themselves. So we de developed things which allows us to also solve that problem. And now it's a two minute uh, shot of the opera, with some explanations. As we mentioned at the beginning, the technology we developed was the basis for a content driven interaction which had one main goal, and that was to support the narrative statement. Machiavelli, as the dominant figure who steers and leads the play, had interactive power over the media stage and the media costumes. In the beginning, he can control the whole stage using different interaction principles, as seen in these sequences. As the opera progresses, Machiavelli loses his power, which is expressed by a lot of his interactivity with the stage. In fact, in a short period of time, the other characters are also able to interact with the stage, usurping Machiavelli's power. 
At the end, even the stage takes control over itself and starts playing its own solo, leaving Machiavelli completely powerless. Machiavelli's decline is also exposed by the loss of his power over the costume projection, which in turn symbolizes his loss of power over the other characters. When the actors take off their white infrared reflective costumes, they reveal black costumes underneath, which can't be detected by the camera and therefore can't be projected upon. When this process is finished, the characters take control of their own destinies, and Machiavelli's power is broken. He is demeaned and ridiculed by the other characters. Machiavelli is torn between the religions, which are represented by three coloured and textured tables. <coughs> At the end, Machiavelli also uses this struggle, and the religions grow to fill the whole of the stage. So I hope you have seen it's not about technology, it's really about developing something which supports the storyline, which supports the director uh, to dramatize uh, the opera. So I want to take the last 15 minutes now for an actual project, which we just finished uh, uh, end of last year. It's the BMW Museum in Munich, um, which we uh, designed together with the scenographers from Atelier Brückner in Stuttgart. And I want to use this as an example how different methods to translate information in, in space can be used. So if we are thinking about information, how to translate it in space, we have this more or less these three uh, ways. So we do it either atmospherical, we do it fact-driven, or we do it uh, metaphorically. Uh, I start with a fact-driven one. So the BMW Museum is a brand museum, so we have to tell the history on one place in a very precise way. So we decided to make a, a touch-sensitive table, as you've seen before, a little bit longer as the one for the numbers. Uh, and uh, we showed every single development of uh, BMW on this table. So you found every car, every every uh, aero, airplane motor, uh, you found everything onto it. You were able to explore it and again very easily to interact with it. So it's uh, in a way, as we observed, uh, people are there between 10 to 14, 15 minutes, which is a very long time uh, uh, for this very, let's say, dry effect driven uh, information. But again, they find something, they find probably a car which their uncle, uncle was driving and they're talking about that. And uh, although it's content-wise the same as you probably would have been printed in the former times on a, on a wall, it's a totally different thing because you're not juxtaposed to a wall. So this was more the f uh, is one example for the fact-driven translation of information in space. And uh, the next one is uh, the atmospherical. Um, this very often sounds very unfunctional, but it's in this case, or we always try to do it and use it in a very functional way. So uh, BMW had a problem 
because they decided to only extend their, uh, their, their former museum into a new museum. Uh, this only give, uh, gave us, let's say, 60% more space, but at the end, it's compared to Mercedes-Benz, it's only 30% of the uh, space we had to design it. So uh, it was extended into the former garage, and we decided to build houses into this part because it's the city where cars are in. Nevertheless, it is a very small museum for a car museum. So we had to find something which extends it. You can switch the light on if you like now. So, <laughs> um, so we extended it by making the walls in the inner plaza covered with media. So we were able to extend it through three-dimensional graphics, but also through movement. Again, we try to use uh, something which, at, in first place, gives the impression of a facade, and in, in the second phase, probably you experience it as a medium. Again, monochrome LEDs, opaque glass. We used by purpose facade elements, so that people experience as a facade. And now we have every single dot on these walls we can steer and we can make animations with. And from the very beginning, uh, the client agreed not to show any kind of new cars or something, but to be very abstract. To have abstract movements with, with, which allows you on one hand to extend the space because you have three-dimensional movement, and on the other, uh, to give reflections onto cars because they are meant to drive and not to park, but in the museum they are parking. Okay, set up. <coughs> so this is now how it looks like and you can see uh, really only abstract uh, motifs, for instance, zooms onto different parts. or typography, or motion graphics. And it's very, very important because uh, every time uh, a visitor is going out of the, of the so-called buildings, the space becomes bigger because it always changed. <coughs> so this is the plaza. So if, if there are not many visitors, the whole thing gets reactive. But you see the reflection onto the cars, this was very important. Sometimes very subtle, sometimes a little bit more dramatized. It was, in a way it was, difficult to find the right balance because the cars, they are the first thing in the museum and the walls are only a context for it. But as you can see, people are not always staring on the walls or... Coming now to the third, this is the metaphorical translation. And that's the most difficult one, not for us as designers, but to convince clients to uh, use a metaphorical language. In this case, the brief was for the very first space to show the design process, how a car is being designed from technicians and designers, and usually you have talking heads in there. So some interviews or some tape drawings or something like that. But we could convince the client to say, let's go for a, a kind of surface in space which tells the story of a design process. So we did experiments with grids, this kind of stripes, even with fabric, but ended up with spheres. And uh, 
then we proposed BMW to tell the design story in with, with spheres. And they said, okay, you're crazy, you can't do it. We can't tell our story of design with spheres. Uh, and then out of their own motivation, we did a test setup with 25 of the spheres. And when they saw them, they were immediately convinced. So you only have to show the things physical. Uh, this is uh, our experience now. And then we invest, let's say, 10, 15,000 euros, have a test set up, but then we can do the job. So we proved that, uh, on one hand, that it's precise, that it's not noisy, and it's, that it's very mesmerizing, that people are open to decipher the story behind it. And I think that's the uh, most important part in, if you're uh, uh, telling stories in a metaphorical way, that people are open to decipher something. And if they decipher and find the uh, story behind it, then they really have it in there. So we made this uh, virtual thing with uh, 700 spheres and the 25 spheres in, as physical objects. Then we developed the storyline. We learned out from that. So the whole thing starts in chaos. Then the first abstract form appears. Then they start to compete. That's the design process. Uh, in, at BMW, they always build three cars and th th throw two away. And then at the end, you have to find a car. So that's now a two, half, two and a half minute uh, excerpt out of the uh, nine minute storyline. So we showed six cars. very quickly to the making of. Uh, so as we always do, we do an do a in-house uh, in kind of test it up, program the whole thing. Uh, then we do it, give it outside for uh, mass production. And then it goes into the museum. Then we, forehand we did a storyline. So it's not only the spheres, but there's also sound. There are uh, designers and technicians talking about uh, their jobs, so it's a combination between sound and, uh, and the spheres. Content production for everyone who is technically interested, uh, so we don't uh, look for every one number and say, okay, now it's second seven, please uh, sphere number 
35 go to centimeter 51. Uh, what we are doing, uh, we are using a 3D model of a car, putting a li light onto it from above, and then we got a so-called elevation texture, which means uh, the lightest part are the highest ones and the darkest ones are the lowest ones. So these are then the values we are pumping into the, the system. So here you can see it. Um, as you see, these are pixels in space. We call them voxels, physical pixels. And if you are working on a computer, you can easily do an undo if you have problems with your virtual pixels. But if you have a problem with physical pixels, you can't do an undo. And we had one major problem, let's say it like that. It was three weeks before the opening. There was a software bug which told the spheres not to go down, but to go up. And uh, they were very fast going up. <laughs> Sorry, you missed the sound. You have to, you have to get the sound. It's, it's okay. So it, it destroyed the whole thing more or less. And it was not our direct problem at the time, so the suppliers, but they managed it to do it. Now it's, it's running since uh, nearly a year now. Uh, I want to take the last five minutes to answer a question which Michael, Michael asked me uh, in the inter interview we did before. Uh, where do we take our motivation from over 20 years? And I answered, um, we are all teaching. or well, not everyone, but nearly everyone at Artcom is teaching. And I had the privilege to teach at the University of the Arts since 91. Um, and this provokes me, and it's now a little reminis reminiscence onto my students. Um, they provoke me to be precise. So if you're getting older, and being a little bit successful, why should you question yourself? You know? But if you have students, you have to be precise because if you don't be precise, they ask questions you can't answer. Uh, I have here from, from uh, older uh, lectures some projects, but I think I'll show you once, only to get, get a glimpse about the next uh, generation. Uh, we are doing every semester an assignment so this is an assignment about minimum media intervention in the city. So we have all these huge facades in the city. Um, but I asked students to make low-tech minimal interventions in the city and to communicate with media in the city. Um, these students made a, I, I want to say this inter, uh, invention, uh, which could be already had been invented 40 years ago. So what he did, he took a camera body, had an exposed film, used a flash, so he flashed to the exposed film, so you can flash some typography onto the wall, for instance, and he added a, a slave sensor, what is a, which you have in, in, uh, in a, a photo studio, so you're flashing one flash and all the others sense it and flash at the same time. What happens if he has this object somewhere in the city space and you're taking a picture and have a flash, his flash is also flashing, and you get a text in your, into your picture. So this is what he did at Checkpoint Charlie here. So you are entering the American sector, blah, 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 and every tourist who flashed this picture at that time got the hundreds of people who died last year by, by trying this at the US-American border. <laughs> so here a little movie.
that's because there's something on the sign that's that's in my picture, but it's not on the sign. <laughs> Okay, then he did a second version. So this is the one from illustrate function, form heights function. So he could do it secretly. Um, and this is the outcome. <laughs> so this is fake, but this is really. It. So what he did is when Obama was here, it was really like if a priest are coming, he has this uh, situation where he's preaching from, and every on every single, not on every, but on 90% of the press images we have a cross on there, you know, not meant to be there. But the real tough thing was uh, then he went to uh, um, China, to Beijing, to the Olympics, and did this one. And this was really dangerous. <laughs> Okay, so he made a really tough machine, so it was not anymore having a, having a slide, so it was a real laser cut at Dove he used. Sorry. Okay, I speed it up a little bit. So it was really tough because it totally observed the space. <laughs> yeah, that, this is another question I can. No, it's not normal. This should have gone around the world. Yeah, but it, 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 it gone, it's gone all around the world. Yeah. 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 But, uh, it has gone around the world? Yeah. You missed it. Oh, I missed it. Yeah. Too much stuff on YouTube. Yeah. But this should have been, I mean, I landed the dog on, or, or, I mean, this could have been picked no. up yeah. by, you know, there could have been a campaign. Yeah, yeah. This is what we made sure that it not happened, because we, I went with him directly to the patent lawyer to prevent him from the advertisement uh, people because, you know, for sure they immediately called him and asked him, can we do a Coca-Cola campaign on Brandenburg Gate, you know? And so... Only with my tip, only with me. Yeah, it's now only with me and, and uh, so, but... Okay, um, there are a lot of other things and probably you can understand. It's not about getting ideas from the students, but it's about really to discuss this kind of things and to be able to, do, to react on things like that or provoke things like that. So it's more about giving, very often, and I think all the, all the professors and teachers in here know that very often it's giving more an idea and you can't use it anymore for yourself. But it's uh, open up your mind. Okay, because we are in the Berlin School, I give you a 10 second, uh, no, this was one second thing, a, t a 10 second, um, review on why I think that we survived the last 21 years. Uh, we had our 20th birthday last year, and so I was forced to make a little uh, speech about that, and I thought, okay, let's think about why do we exist uh, making s such kind of not really money-making projects. Uh, so I came up and Sometimes some of these are no-brainers, some can't, can't be transferred into other uh, contexts. But one thing, what is very important is flat hierarchy, positions only through uh, competence, no-brainer, but I see it very often not followed. <laughs> Motivation to reinvent yourself, I think that is, especially if you are in a, in a kind of research environment, it's very important not to invent, only invent something, but to reinvent yourself. Uh, the third one is openness toward experiments, and very important, the ability to, to recognize when they fall, fail, when they fail, 
Next one is courage to fail. Also very important for us because if you don't have the courage to fail, you always do this safe stuff. Uh, for us, it was always important being small and flexible. Uh, no subsidiaries. So think local, act global, stay at home. Never make an Artcom New York or Artcom Beijing. Uh, breaking rules only if you know them. Uh, creating an atmosphere for debate, culture of constructive controversy. Dealing open with the results, so meaning sharing things. Knowledge, results, very important, not only internally but also externally. And having a clear identifiable attitude. And this brings me to the beginning of my lecture. I think we achieve it quite well inside of Artcom, but it's very difficult to make people outside really clear what we are doing. I hope the last hour gave you a little bit insight in what we are doing, and I want to thank you very much for coming here in this beautiful summer evening and listen to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Now, um, we will take some time for questions. Mm. I will start with the first one. On your list, would you put Berlin also yes. as a city, yes. as a place? I think this, this is very important. Uh, we discussed this before. When, when we started Artcom in 88, it was the pre-war time. Berlin was totally unprofessional. It was only a subculture here, and I think this gave us the openness to bring this kind of people together. I, I think it would, wouldn't be able to do it at that time in Munich or in Hamburg or so, no way. In Gelsenkirchen? Yeah, yeah, prob yeah. Probably, <laughs> probably Gelsenkirchen. That's not an estimated list, yeah. Really inspiring, motivating, um, and that of your, your student as well. Um, the first seven years was about uh, prediction. Mm -hmm. Now uh, we're almost at 2010. Do you have a, a sense or a feeling, a vision for uh, the next seven years? Yes, it's actually in September the next seven years starts. And we don't have a clear mission statement up to now, but we never had this clear mission statement, uh, uh, mission statement at the beginning, at the verge of this uh, seven years phase. Um, a little bit you are sucked into it if you create a, the, the appropriate environment. So if you, I, I think this is what you are learning here and you know it's better than me. It's about to create an open environment, to make experiments, to let things start. So let's, uh, the, the, the last seven years they started with this sensitive surface things. You know, this was something really, really new at that time. And we showed it up the first time and uh, we, looked at the people, how they experienced that, how they really went deep into that, how they spent more time with this than the other exhibits, and they said, okay, this is something. Let's do something, let's use everyday objects. You know? So you invent something, hopefully we do it also next time. I think one thing you have seen, the kinetic sculpture is something which we for sure are following, so we actually did already follow-up projects with that, so going into the physical world, and I, I think uh, my, my, the title of, of my exhibition was Getting Physical, so this is for us a little bit the statement, the starting first step in the next seven years, although we are doing it all already since two years. Truly adorable what you do and really inspiring, and I think especially that opera project mm. was enormously impressive, because I think there's probably no relation from a financial aspect as well and like the amount of work you put in in, in considering time span which I think is mm -hmm. fantastic and for such a project like what sort of time span does it actually take to create something like that? Uh, this project we started in 99 <coughs> and then uh, so it was commissioned for uh, Opera Biennale in Munich and yeah. they had the topic electronics or media and opera um, and then they postponed it. So we had, instead of one year, we had three years. 
but actually it was, let's say, it was half a year development. And then another six weeks for uh, dramatizing in a test phase. So we had the singers there and we worked with the, with the whole uh, company for at least three, four weeks, you know. So how many people are involved? This was a very small number. We only had been seven people for this project. At the beginning, you huh? said that um, your work is not being recognized or taken seriously by advertising. Uh, looking at what you've done yeah. for the brand BMW, yeah. I would have thought that you created the most magnificent <laughs> advertising BMW you can yeah. think of. Do you have any return in, in terms of visiting numbers, feedback as to how the museum mm -hmm. and the technology and everything that BMW is displaying mm -hmm. to the public, um, are they, is BMW feeding back to you what this is doing for their brand? Uh, yes. So probably it's, it's a misunderstanding. I, I was too rude at the beginning. So we, we are, let's say, we are not welcome into the advertisement world. We're not welcomed into the arts world. So they say, okay, you're doing interesting stuff and you can do a little bit in our world. But, you know, I know sure is where my works had been discussed and I know how this, uh, how the outcome is. So let's, it's let's say, good. no, 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 we are, we, are, we are too different. We are too different. Uh, but, you know, it's not about BMW. They do their research and you will, I promise you will be very surprised in December. You will see something new, uh, what they are doing out of this, what we did by themselves. So it's not our thing. But uh, there was a, a lot of discussion in the web. So and I, I got a, a blog entry from a girl in the Midwest in nowhere who really made the most precise uh, re-engineering of BMW brand values by describing our sculpture. So, okay, this is better than any kind of marketing bullshit I've heard from them, from them. You know, it was this, I'm a high school girl from so and so, and it's so precise, you see all the things go, going together in a precise way. If, if one is not precise, every, uh, the whole thing is nothing. And so, wow, you know, and this is something where we do research about, so we... Uh, well, what you created is interaction with the brand. Exactly, exactly. And it was the, this is another thing, but this is what BMW really also uh, uh, really liked. It was for one week. It was the most seen video in 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 the car. Um, uh, how do you say? Industry. No, no, in in, in 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 YouTube in the car world. You know, okay. the, the, or even even the new Ferrari was behind this one. And this was was a good, good outcome for them. More questions? Uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. seems to be key. I mean, you are working with various sort of brains together, designers, mm -hmm. artists, uh, technicians, <laughs> computer mm -hmm. genius, directors, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Can you say something about this uh, uh, way of working yeah. and, and, and how you see it, mm -hmm. this way of working in the future also? I think at the beginning of, of every new medium, you have to be in, a, in an interdisciplinary environment because there are all these different things are not sorted out. And for instance, I never learned in the 80s to program. So it was absolutely necessary to have a programmer. Nowadays, in our medium, it's probably not so necessary anymore. So there are these computational designers <laughs> who have all the capabilities. So my students, they can program, they can iron, they can make these physical objects and uh, so I think from at the beginning you always need this kind of environment. We have it up to now and to uh, give another example for the next seven years our uh, uh, development department is going to be a known company by itself. So we are now splitting up and n not in, uh, in a very good way and we are cooperating but uh, we talked about this before too that they, they want to do products now and okay, do products, but I think this is the dead of innovation if you're doing products because you have to take care about all maintenance and whatever. So I think now in our medium, it's not anymore as necessary to be interdisciplinary like in the 80s. And there are probably new fields like, not so new anymore, but like, like bio uh, tech things where, where it's really necessary to have this from different fields.
uh, speaking of products um, mm. and the patent for Google Earth, mm. um, is, did you do a patent for the, the tactile no, no, no. top as well? Because I know micro, Microsoft Surface. Yeah, I used it now. Yeah. No, we, we do, did the patent on the idea of the whole zooming process and how you can achieve this technically. You know, because this is the idea only putting the data into the computer which you need to only show this field of view. This was not done before and this is the, the key factor. Uh, final thing, um, I mean, it's, it's absolutely remarkable what we've seen. Uh, well, it comes from talent, uh, but when you have read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers, Outliers um, he makes a major statement that on talent, talent plus at least 10,000 10, hours practicing mm -hmm. in order to really yeah. be great. Can you say something about that? You have your 10,000 hours behind you. <laughs> yeah? yeah, now I can say that I'm talented. Or no, you are not talented. <laughs> I mean, he but, makes a point that, yeah. I mean, talent is fine, yeah. Yeah? but you know, the practice, the yeah. preparation over time really makes a yeah. difference. Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, they are both. So, so as we, we had been all young and very talented, and now we are old, probably less talented but more experienced. And I think that's a very good and uh, for me personally a very healthy situation. So I, I kept a little bit of my talent but I got a lot of experience. Okay, we have something for you. Uh, you can choose the older talent or the younger talent. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, the older talent is a bigger thing. As always. And that is Bauhaus. You're, okay. you're a real fan of Bauhaus. As you know. And the younger talent is Stefan Sagmeister's book. Yeah. Things I've learned in my life. Yeah? So I have to. So far. To choose. Or? You can choose. I take this one because I'm a good friend of Stefan. And, <laughs> and you have it. I have more. Yeah. I you have, have more of those. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> okay. It's your choice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good one. drinks and we will get uh, Joachim to sign the wall. Okay. Yeah? okay. <laughs>